Hello and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself Marta, where as always I'm here with the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Today we're going to kick off proceedings with a bit of an update to the NVIDIA GTX 1660 Super. Now the other day I talked about Igor's Lab or Igor's Lab, whichever way you want to pronounce it, and how they made some comments about the release date of Ampere. Now go and watch up my video from yesterday if you haven't already seen it where I discuss this very topic. But something that I neglected to mention from his report, I just kind of want to revisit it now, is his discussion of the 1660 Super clock rate. Now before I get into the actual clock rate of this particular graphics card, I just want to say that the reporter here has a very good reputation for being pretty damn on the money and of course you can find a link to their article in the description below this video. So with that in mind what do they actually have to say? Well basically they're claiming that the 1660 Super is going to be clocked at 1785 megahertz and will feature GDDR6. So what does this actually mean in terms of practical applications versus AMD as of course we're having some lower end Navi cards um, primarily the RX 5500 XT coming out quite soon and if his information is correct this would actually put the GTX 1660 Super ahead of the 5500 XT from AMD. And further according to their calculations we're going to be seeing a 2.8% performance difference between the 5500 XT and the GTX 1660 Super meaning that the Super will be 2.8% faster and the 5600 XT, which has been rumoured, will be 11% faster than the 1660 Super. So what we're seeing here is it just beating the 16, sorry, the 5500 XT, but will not quite have the punch needed to counter the 5600 XT that has been rumoured from AMD. So as we all predicted, the lower end from both companies is really heating up. That competition is really there. Obviously, they both know that they need to nail the lower end as much as they do the higher end because obviously that's where we're going to see the real volume of sales. You know, not many people can afford you know a thousand pounds or whatever for a graphics card. So, going to be really interesting to see the back and forth between the two companies as we move forward with the release dates of both these cards. But speaking of the war between AMD and NVIDIA, we have a bit of an update regarding TSMC's 7nm supply situation. Now, of course, we've already discussed previously on the channel how TSMC is just struggling to keep up with the huge demand that they have for their 7nm architecture. A huge amount of technology uses it, and obviously AMD using it a bunch, and um, according to the NVIDIA VP, who commented some time ago to Tom's Hardware, they are going to be using both TSMC and Samsung in the next generation GPUs. So we are going to be seeing TSMC continue to be used there by NVIDIA as well. So apparently, according to a report from Tom's Hardware, things are not going to get any better in terms of the supply issues. In fact, they're going to get worse, uh, as apparently... Apple are upping the production of the A13 Bionic. So basically, demand for this has surpassed expectations and Apple has purported, purported, reportedly, words are hard, put in another order for 8 million smartphones. So Apple used TSMC as their primary fab. So a company like Apple are obviously going to be pretty much at the front of the queue for the supply that TSMC have. Obviously AMD are still, and NVIDIA are still important companies and customers for TSMC, but I'm just saying that I feel like this demand is going to gobble up a lot and they're already straining a little bit. It obviously is going to help that we're apparently going to be seeing both Samsung and TSMC being used um, in the graphics for the next generation, uh, probably Ampere, but obviously we're going to see potential issues of supply to actual customers as in you know meaning you and I rather than the companies from TSMC but of course we'll have to see and wait wait and see either way um the actual impact that this has on the consumer level so we're going to move on to some more AMD flavored news next with the Agita update 1.0.0.4. So, so of course we recently to start discussed um, Agita and how it's going to bring a whole host of improvements to the Ryzen family of processors, and there was a tweet sent to one Usmas, but basically someone asked if it has any details about Agita 1.0.0.4 and if they knew what was meant by more than 100 improvements/enhancements. 
So in response, he said, quote, I can't open all the cards, but users will have a working at PBO slash PB2, which Robert spoke about in the video three months ago. Some changes in CCX overclocking. We are also waiting for the new SMU 46.54 plus and attempt to fix the boost, stable boost without short term peaks for 3900X and 3950X. And let's don't translate that to English. Like, what does that actually mean? Essentially, this means that it's likely to bring us a more stable CPU frequencies under heavy loads. So, as he mentioned, that all important improved performance and better overclocking control. Obviously, we have seen recently uh, some controversy with Ryzen 3000 not reaching the reported clock speeds. Obviously, this issue has since been resolved, as far as I'm aware. But obviously it was an issue that kind of plagued an otherwise very successful launch for Ryzen 3000 CPUs. So it's nice to see these updates coming just before the launch of the 16 core as well, which is going to be very, very important. And obviously for anyone who already owns, say, a 3900X, you're not exactly going to complain. So let's move on, shall we, from Camp AMD to their arch nemesis, Intel and Tiger Lake. So, what do we have this time around? Well, the very keen-eyed folks over at Pharonix.com, whose article you will find linked in the description below this video, have spotted some very interesting information about Tiger Lake on the open source Neo Compute enablement so far. So, essentially, what they've had is a support being put into that Neo Compute runtime for Gen 12 at Tiger Lake. Again, for more information on all that, their article is below. So what do we actually learn about Tiger Lake here? Well, so we see a lot of information that points towards mobile. For example, there's a uh, 15 watt Ultrabook being listed, 12 watt, 45 watt, 65 watt desktop, 45 watt and 65 watt workstations, and a bunch of um, IDs as well, which are labeled GT2. As for the L3 cache, we do see a significant increase versus Ice Lake. We see 3072 KB of L3 cache compared to the 1920 of Intel's Ice Lake, and we also see a doubling for the L3 bank count as well. Now, obviously, these are going to change most likely. The processor is still in development. This is just a support being added for now as Intel you know, and their magicians do their thing in the background, cook away and tweak and improve. So do not take these as set in stone, but still interesting to see that significant improvement in the cache size. And we can also see for now, at least we see VS, HS, DS, GS thread counts are at 336, which is a, again, significant increase from the 224 we saw in Ice Lake. So the more we learn about Gen 12, the more interesting it sounds, to be quite frank, and I'm really interested to just get my teeth stuck into it and see what Intel are actually have in store for us with Tiger Lake. But let's finish things up today, shall we, with some updates from Micron and their 128-layer 3D NAND. So according to a report from Anantech.com, Micron has taped out the first fourth generation 3D NAND memory devices, which will actually include its brand new replacement gate architecture. So this basically confirms that they are on track to produce fourth gen 3D NAND in calendar 2020. But Micron has already said that this is only going to be used for select applications. However, I still find this stuff interesting to talk about. So what do we actually see specs-wise and capability-wise for this 128-layer 3D NAND? Well, we see up to 128 active layers. It continues to use the CMOS under the array design approach. And again, it has a new type of gate. So... Previously, we saw floating gate tech being used, and now instead they're using a gate replacement technology. And essentially what they're aiming to do here is try to lower die size and cost while also bringing us some nice improvements and performance. And we also have a quote from Sanjay Matura, whose name I hopefully have pronounced correctly, CEO and president of Micron. 
and they said, quote, we achieved our first yielding dies using replacement gate or RG for short. This milestone further reduces the risk for our RG transition. As a reminder, our first RG node will be 128 layers and will be used for a select set of products. We don't expect RG to deliver meaningful cost reductions under financial year 2021 when our second generation RG node is broadly deployed. Consequently, we're expecting minimal cost reductions in NAND in financial year 2020. Our RG production deployment approach will optimize the ROI of our NAND capital investments. So there we have it, more technology being cooked up from Micron and very interested to see the real world implications of the decrease in die size and of course the increase in performance. So that is me done for this video guys, thank you so much for watching, as always your support is highly appreciated, do hope you've all had a lovely weekend, do remember to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already, it does help out a great deal, and I'll see you next time, bye bye.